From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Ferris here. It is a Tuesday. Good show on tap for you. I want to open up the phone lines, invite you to join in the conversation because you're bound to have some questions, comments, or thoughts about what is one of the two highest profile criminal cases, I believe, in the mid-state region going on right now, okay? There's two very high profile cases. One, of course, the Holly Bobo case, which it continues to move forward, new developments on that every week. And the other one is the Vanderbilt rape case. And that's the one we're gonna specifically talk about today because there've been some changes so uh, we broke the story yesterday on a motion filed under seal, but I learned what the details are in that. And it appears as though this uh, trial, which was scheduled for just two weeks from now, the Vanderbilt rape case, and we'll get into the details of it if you're still uh, not as familiar with it as you'd like to be, is going to be delayed. And we're going to talk about it this morning and what's happening next with News Channel 5 legal analyst Nick Leonardo. Good morning, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Nick. Nice to have you on. You helped me with the story yesterday. And I think you and I both were in the preparation phase thinking, hey, if there's no continuance, we're going to be doing gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage on this. I know Brian and Mary Elena and everyone else behind the scenes here were gearing up for it on August 11th. Doesn't appear like that's going to happen, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, at this point in time, I believe the defense is still receiving uh, the state's evidence. When what is that, discovery? Discovery, that's what yeah. they call it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's a lot more discovery that they have to review before they'd be ready for trial. And in a case like this with multiple co-defendants, it's a felony. And, uh, you know, the, the chances are that it would have been continued the first time around anyway. So I, I, really? I think that the judge, in this case, the first request, I think he will continue it. But it, it's kind of odd. You get a taste of what it's like being a lawyer, you yeah. know, because, you, you know, you're always you know, ready to go. And mm -hmm. sometimes you don't get a chance to go or things get continued and other things are out of your control. So lawyers were really used to this. You know, you're preparing all weekend and Monday something gets continued or it gets continued at the last minute and you're shuffling your schedule. So, but it's, it's kind of the nature of the business. Yep, that's what you said. And it's interesting. Now, the, the judge is going to hear this motion on Friday. He hasn't granted it yet, but I think I agree with you. It's very likely he's going to grant their motion. Prosecution likely not to object to it. Would you think Tom Thurman, you know, I mean, they get a say in this too, don't they? At least oh, absolutely. they can voice their opinion on what do they think of a continuance? What do you think will happen then? Well, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, presume anything, but I don't believe that uh, that Tom Thurman or those folks are going to have the DA's office are going to have any objection to a continuance the first time set. Now, I could be wrong. I'm not privy to their discussions. I'm not sure where they are in discovery, uh, you know. And the tighter the case gets closed, uh, the less we're all kind of privy sure. to what's going on. But being this is that this is the first time set, I would think that uh, Judge Watkins, who's a great judge, I, you know, I don't think he'd have any problem, you know, granting a continuance. But if he does, I I feel as though he would set a new trial date to, to keep the pressure on uh, the parties to, to get the case ready and move it forward. All right, and you're wondering one reason why is there delay? You know, what, what causes this? And you talked about how they're still getting discovery. Now, here's my point. Okay, this, this alleged attack, and again, keep in mind, there's four former Vanderbilt football players who are accused of raping a co-ed on an on-campus dormitory at Vanderbilt. I think that was back on June 23rd of last year. So it's been over a year, and they've been incarcerated and then posted bond, all four suspects are free on bond. Why is discovery still being exchanged a year later? Why is it taking so long? Well, you know, and, and to try to give an easy answer to the viewers, and that is, uh, you know, that the the architect of this litigation are the people who, who control, you know, the infrastructure, and that is the state of Tennessee, the district attorney's office. Right. They have changed the charges around a little bit, uh, and so as a result of that, you know, that that's can also bring a little delay, but you know I'm sure that the you know the state of Tennessee may have a difficult time getting uh, the evidence they need from Vanderbilt or from hospitals or wherever it may be, and they're still getting that information over to uh, the defense team. And the state of Tennessee, in every criminal case, has a duty to turn over everything they intend to use or anything exculpatory, which means leading away from the crime. So they want to make sure that they do their job. And this is a big case, and there's multiple co-defendants, right? Um, and so um, you know it's just it's kind of normal for them to you know still be going through discovery, especially especially when the case still continues to unfold and charges continue to, to be switched around, for lack of a better Just really word. basic law one-on-one -on -one for some of our viewers. When you're sitting there going, now, Nick, you're talking about discovery and exchange of... Just understand this. The prosecution's investigated this case. They've collected evidence that they think leads to, you know, the prosecution of these four defendants. And they are required. There, there aren't supposed to be any surprises. Sure. They are required with all this evidence they've turned up, DNA evidence, statements from witnesses or the victim, to provide that 
to the defense and vice versa. I suppose if the defense comes across something, they need to provide it to the prosecution. But someone sitting at home who's not familiar with the legal system is like, wait a second, you're saying they have to tell everyone what they have planned. It reminds me of that movie, My Cousin Vinny, which I don't know if you ever saw it. It is so funny with Joe Pesci. I thought it was a great movie. It was like Joe Pesci didn't, you know, he got his law degree and didn't really understand how it was. And he was defending uh, his cousin. And all of a sudden, the prosecution came up and said, you can come over and look at all the evidence I've collected. And he goes, what? You're going to let me see that? not realizing that's the way it works. They share it. Talk about how there's no surprises. There have to be, you know, open books on both sides. Well, when I first started law school, Nick, I had, um, I, I wasn't aware of that. And I thought okay. that, you know, you could amass all of your surprise secret, evidence secret, over yeah. here. And you, just, you know, would just be this big Perry Mason moment in yeah. court. Uh, but one of the, you know, the principles of our legal system, you know, is, uh, you know, there being no surprise on either side. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, you have to show the other side your hand, essentially, and show what you have, especially the state of Tennessee. Uh, and it's also the same in civil cases. There's no trial by ambush here in Tennessee or really in America at all. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but one exception that's important to note in the criminal context is that uh, if you ask the state to see their hand or to see their discovery or the evidence they're going to use in their case in chief, then that, re that triggers a reciprocal duty on the defense counsel mm -hmm. to show their hand. So in some of the cases that I've been involved in, I haven't asked the state to see their hand because I didn't want them to know what I've got. Okay, okay so, so if I work. ask the state to see the state's hand, they've got to show it, but then I'm also going to have to show mine as well. So sometimes you don't ask because you know what they got and you don't want them to see your hand. Gotcha. So sometimes, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. But it just that's what it's about. And we've heard time and again from attorneys for Brandon Vandenberg, one of the main defendants in this case, have complained that they haven't felt they've gotten all of the video evidence in this case. And keep in mind the evidence that we know, there's surveillance video from the dormitory hallway. There's also some video um, that uh, Brandon Vandenberg um, supposedly shot of this alleged attack and all of these clips have been confiscated especially the surveillance video and defense team says they haven't gotten all of it yet there are gaps in it breaks uh, I know Tory Johnson the DA has said we've tried to provide everything that we have in a timely fashion but I guess it's not all there yet. Well, and that's you know that's extremely problematic. I was recently involved in another case where uh, it, there was a videotaped uh, confession, and two minutes of that uh, confession were missing, and the prosecutor's office didn't have it, and the police department didn't have it. What happened is they just forgot to uh, you know to hit the record button okay. or, or change the media they were recording on, and as a result, the whole thing got thrown out with some. Even though it's just an honest mistake, it's not sure. But, see, I don't believe right now that the DA's office here, and no one's saying this, but you know, on, it could be left unsaid has gone into these videos and seen oh well this hurts our case let's erase it that Tom Thurman no. is not no, no, doing no. that that does not I agree. happen I agree. if there are gaps in the tape in my opinion okay it's uh, something like what you just described maybe you know the camera was off at that point or something happened to it that was accidental I, I just don't buy that someone is maliciously going in there snipping out incriminating parts or non incriminating parts of the tape I don't buy that well but you second. know but, but how it works is that you know if, if you're on trial for your life 15 to 25 yeah. years and the state is going to get up here and play this videotape from the hall or the dormitory there at Vanderbilt and there's you know gaps. all of a sudden there's yeah. gaps and there's four or five people well, standing sure, in the hallway and there's blank you know then I, you know I, wh where are those people because because it could very well be that uh, maybe she, maybe this uh, alleged victim uh, was, maybe there's video showing that she was conscious, right. which really negates some of the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the elements that the state's going to, you know, would yeah. like to prove in this uh, case. So I mean, you know, they have a right to see this, and I understand their concern. But I mean, like you said, there's no doubt, you know, that the district attorney's office would, they don't do anything like that. They're not, you know, editing things that uh, hurt them or hurt their case. I mean, they're trying their best to get all this information as quickly as they can from Vanderbilt, and there may. Be be, you know, a perfectly normal explanation as to why those excerpts are missing. Okay, you know what we'll do is we're going to take calls and we've got some coming in. Joe, stay where you are. We'll take a break in a moment. Before we do that, I just want to lay it out just in case for our viewers, you know, some of the details of what we have here. As I said, there's four former Vanderbilt football players accused of um, bringing this victim back and that she supposedly was drunk coming back to the dorm room. You know, a surveillance video shows them doing something suspicious in the hallway that got security to look into it later, but taking her into a room, and the allegation is there that she was raped, okay? They're, they're all four charged with rape. Brandon Vandenberg, supposedly her boyfriend at the time, videotaped some of what supposedly happened to her, okay? Videotaped this, and uh, she apparently was unconscious through this. Keep in mind, folks, 
Whatever happened, she was approached by security two or three days later, oblivious to what happened in that right. dorm room, and said, ma'am, do you realize what happened? She goes, no, that was my boyfriend. Nothing bad happened. And then they, they showed her some video, and all of a sudden she realized some things happened that she did not remember, which brought the case. But, so there's no rape kit in this. There's no memory from the victim of what happened that night. Um, but then they brought the charges against the four of them. It's 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 very very interesting case. How you bring this without a rape kit, without um, her remembering and being able to testify to that regard. But there is video, and that is what's got these kids in trouble. The video, yeah, the fact that Vandenberg had a camera and was videotaping whatever. And then it brings the question, you know, is he a participant? It, let's say he didn't touch her, but the others did. But he's sitting there videotaping it and doing nothing to stop it. Does that make him an accomplice? I mean, sure. I mean, you know, th th he could have some criminal exposure, criminal liability. I mean, I I've always said it's the equivalent of, of driving a getaway car in a bank robbery. Or if you just, you know, you, you if I dropped you off the bank, you ran in, yeah. Nick, and you came back out and said, hey, I just robbed that. If I brought you back to the station and didn't tell anybody and didn't do anything, I mean, I've got, you know, some criminal responsibility for your actions. And so, um, you know, th there can be criminal responsibility for just being present and, and being a part of that and yet not alerting law enforcement or not doing anything thing to, to, you know, help the investigation. Other side note to this, a lot of peripheral, you know, issues is, you know, who will be called as witnesses when this goes to trial? James Franklin, then coach, now at Penn State, very high profile position. What did he or didn't he know about what happened? He's not charged or linked in connection with any sure. cover-up or anything like that, but he was the head football coach at the time. Could he be called and others? Listen, we got to take a break. When we come back, the number is uh, up on the screen, 737-7587. We'll get into this more. I want to hear from you as this case now, you know, scheduled for trial August 11th is going to be postponed probably to next year. Sure. But I uh, want to get your take, too, on, you know, what the prosecution's strongest weapon might be in this. And then also what you think a legitimate defense may be. So we'll take a break. Be back with your calls and more from Nick right after this.